Hey, everybody, and welcome to this second ever Meet the Experts webinar from Playtest Cloud. Uh, my name is Jake, and I work with Playtest Cloud here in Berlin. Uh, so for those of you who don't know about Playtest Cloud, uh, Playtest Cloud is a service which provides real insight to players' behaviors in mobile games. Uh, we have a player panel of about 650,000 players, and our uh, playtesters will play your game in their natural environments, giving you think aloud commentary and touch indicators while playing. Um, it's designed to help studios get a full picture of how players behave with you while gaming. Um, but hey, uh, that's not why we're here today. Uh, today, we're actually here to discuss uh, some game user research in depth and uh, talk with an expert in the field. Um, so before we get started, uh, you'll see up here is a chat area. Feel free to uh, let us know who's here. Maybe say hello, you know, your, uh, maybe give your name and uh, where you're coming from today. Um, as well, uh, the more important thing is we have a Q&A uh, area up here. So if you click on the Q&A tab up top, uh, you can go in there and uh, type in your question. So uh, we have enough material here to talk for the entire hour, but we'd much rather uh, talk with you guys and interact with you guys while um, having this webinar. So uh, we're here to answer your questions and we'd love to make this as interactive as possible. But uh, it's not just me in this uh, webinar today. I have brought along an expert alongside, and I'm really excited to introduce you to her today. Uh, so well, without further ado, uh, we're really excited to introduce uh, Sarah Romoslavsky. Um, and she's joining us today, and she's been a regular user of Playtest Cloud for quite a while now. Um, some of her career highlights, uh, just to name a few. Um, first off, she worked for uh, Scipio, which was a, um, Video gaming service they had these little blocks that you could build and kind of interact with. Um, as well, uh, she kind of built this uh, as a grassroots uh, playtesting service from the ground up with this industry. Um, she also uh, was previously the senior manager of user experience research for Glue Mobile, where she grew the user research function uh, from a team of one to a team of eight while supporting uh, multiple studios and uh, game development teams. Uh, that's where we really got to know her closely, and uh, we've been working with her pretty regularly ever since. Um, yeah, we approached her about uh, becoming our second expert in this uh, Meet the Experts webinar series, and uh, we spent some time earlier a few weeks ago trying to think of a topic, um, and we ended up uh, thinking it was a great contrast to our last uh, webinar, um, which was more evaluative focus. And uh, we wanted to kind of flip that on its head and look into some, some more exploratory work. Uh, that's why we're here today, um, to discuss un unmoderated exploratory research. We see uh, a few of you are here in the chat, and I would like to say hello. I think we have a couple of people from uh, New York, a couple of people from Satellite, uh, or yeah, Satellite, from Seattle, uh, a couple guys out in Northern California, and uh, still more are joining in. So. Uh, Welcome guys, thanks for joining, and uh, yeah, we're really excited to have you. If you have any uh, questions, feel free to post them in the Q&A. Um, but Sarah, uh, I'll let you kind of talk, did I do a good job introducing you? Yeah, anything thanks so much. Oh no, thanks so much for the introduction, and I'm really, really excited for our talk today, and thanks so much for, for having me. Absolutely. Well, we'll jump right into it. Um, I guess kind of the, the obvious first question is, on a really high level, for those people who don't know, what is exploratory research? What are we really going to be talking about today? Yeah. So, you know, I think in a lot of a lot of the time when we times when we think about games user research, we think a lot about things that can be measured and things that can be evaluated, like usability, um, you know, how, you know, what types of people, like what percentage of types of people are playing a certain game and things like that. So exploratory research is a way just to, to understand something really thoroughly. Uh, that could be um, like a theme, that could be a group of people, it could be understanding latent needs um, in uh, sort of non-gaming product research. This can be referred to as the problem space, it can be referred to as discovery, but I think there's a lot of opportunity to bring this type of work into games to inform both you know, the creative process and also things outside of the game as well. And I guess kind of to jump on that as well, what are some maybe examples of um, kind of exploratory research that we can really jump into? 
Yeah, I think so. So, you know, there's definitely plenty of people doing this kind of work in the gaming space. You know, um, perhaps studios have done things like focus groups, you know, when you're going into really, really early and you're not quite sure what your next game is going to be, you might bring in some people and show stimuli in a, in a lab um, to understand things like motivations and or maybe their mental model about something or maybe perhaps you're looking to build a game that simulates you know a, a popular hobby or something like that but there's also ways that you can do that um you in an on moderated fashion where you might be showing people stimuli um using ro remote tools such as yours and probing them and letting them know the questions you want to ask and the stimuli that you set up and, and asking them to talk about what they see or things that they have experienced. Exactly, and it's a lot more exploratory, as we're kind of saying, you know, you don't necessarily mm -hmm. need to have a build, have something that's ready. It's a lot more kind of design, designing scientifically is a good way to put it, maybe? Yeah, so I think what, what's different about this stage of work is that it's actually more divergent so when you're doing work um, sort of later, you're, you're testing solutions and you're trying to narrow down what the best solution might be, what the best direction might be for your game. At this sort of stage, you actually aren't quite sure yet. You actually want to expand your knowledge to understand something, to either gain insights to influence your creative practice or to gain knowledge about, say, a group of people and build empathy with them so that you you either, you know, you can throw out your biases or throw out your assumptions about what kind of game might be best for a group of people. So this is this is not necessarily testing solutions, and you don't have to worry about having a solution or a build or or even concept art to test. Rather, this is about starting from what you're really curious about, you know, you know, maybe there's something in pop culture right, right now that you're like, wow, I really want to learn more about that because I think that could become a great game, but I want to understand it really deeply. Yeah, and I think we were discussing this earlier as well. We were kind of talking about um, one of the things that I really was questioning was how do you keep it from becoming too scientific? You know, it's, it's a balance, you know, mm -hmm. as game designers, we are... Um, really going in and we're mixing art and it's really kind of a more artistic and kind of free flow and you design what you want kind of thing. But also with this, it seems like it's very scientific and rigid. You'd say, okay, the research supports this. So we're gonna design, design a game exactly like this. You know, how do you find that balance between those? Yeah, so I think what's really great about doing this um, kind of problem space or discovery work in games is that games are part art, part science. So, um, you know, this kind of work if, if say you're familiar with qualitative work, you know, a lot of times you're trying to really work until you hear repeated measures. Um, but one of the things that's important uh, in doing discovery work is you, you wanna at least like lay the foundation of, of understanding. So you can even just start, like start, start with like five people um, and build the stimuli, figure out what you're curious about and you don't have to worry so much as, as having a perfect sample size. That's not really what this work is about. Um, I think it's really leaning more towards the creative practice and really taking theories and actually like turning them into, into part of your game design um, methods. So you can do the exploratory work. Here are things that were, that were like, wow, that's a really different way of thinking about it. And um, you know, bring it to the team, putting it up in your on your Trello board, because you know, right now we're not all co-located, so we can't just like hang stimuli up or or go to the whiteboard. But you know, whatever you're using to share with your team, you know, take those insights um, from say the you know the the 20 minute or half hour or 40 minute um, sessions that you might do, and um, extract things that might be inspiring to you. So it's actually kind of less about the science and I'd say more about the art and I think that's what why we do why we design games and why it's so much fun to do game user research. Absolutely and I think kind of the, the neat thing as well that we um, definitely want to mention is um, asynchronous um, research mm -hmm. and kind of this unmoderated kind of research you know we were uh, discussing earlier as well um, and kind of talking about you know the, the classic kind of method is to you know find your uh, players, you know, through whatever means and sorts of resources you have to kind of find players, you drive them downtown, 
driving system, you know, your, your headquarters and some skyscraper, you have your special testing room. But really, um, what's really great is this is a little bit nicer with uh, asynchronous and unmoderated, uh, kind of has its own benefits too, you know, especially in these times. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of a, what do you think is kind of the benefit of doing it unmoderated versus a moderated test in this capacity? Sure, yeah. I mean, I don't think, you know, there's always the benefit of talking to people one on one in real time because you can probe, but there's also some strengths of doing things um, unmoderated. For one thing, people are in their natural state. Um, and uh, for another thing, you know, there's, yeah, you don't have to, like, if you might be in this uh, different time zone, that was mm -hmm. one of the things that was really helpful for us, um, you know, back in my previous role, we had people working across the entire, you know, across the world, but we had users that were in certain time zones. So this meant that the person could do, do this, to, could do the study when it was right for them, rather than having to con conform to say our schedules. Um, and another thing that's really great is uh, for this kind of discovery work, one of the things that's really important is that this idea of listening. Mm -hmm. So really just, um, and, and while there's a lot of people who do this in real time and the um, sort of the expert practitioners of this work usually say, you know, call a person. One of the things they say is you don't actually need video. Um, and so what we're really just trying to do is listen and build empathy. And I think you can also do that and get a lot of really great insights and without doing it in real time. So this would be a way to start to start doing this practice and just building some baseline insights around around people's you know behaviors, emotions that they might experience in games. Um, and it's just like a really easy uh, way to do it. Yeah, and I guess too, um, kind of going off of that as well is, how do you really approach even recruiting in that capacity? How do you even kind of, yeah, go for it. Yeah, so I think what's really interesting about this work is it's basically, it's like you can start doing research before you have anything. Mm -hmm. um, you, you have a seed of thought, uh, you have, maybe you had a game jam and you're just like, okay, we have some ideas, but we want to learn more about them. So I think there's a number of ways you can go about recruitment. Perhaps you're a team that already has things like marketing segments that you, you know, this is a great opportunity to, to start collaborating with your marketing team if you have one um, and you've worked, come together and you've brainstormed and you say, I think this might be the kinds of people who play this game. So perhaps you're trying to learn, let's say, let's use the theme of, you know, I want to learn about connection in games, especially right now, like during COVID and this is and then we've come together and we brainstorm you know there's people who are trying to connect with their families there's people who are um, connecting because they can't um, you know for maybe romance romantic reasons who knows and and so you can really go wild and think outside of the box and then you can extract what you think those behaviors might be and try to assess for that like in a screener um, or you can just start you know start simple and just try to recruit for a variety a variety of backgrounds, you know, ages, gender, uh, racial backgrounds, um, accessibility backgrounds, to just make sure you're hearing from people who would have a variety of experiences. And then, you know, you could start with five, you can start with 10, but you'll, what what's basically, you'll know you're, you're it's, you know, there'll be a good sign if you're starting to hear sort of a, a variety of insights coming in, sort of a multitude of experiences. If you're kind of hearing the same thing over and over, perhaps there are only like, there's only one type of thinking style, but likely you just might need to go back and think, well, who else could we bring in to make sure we diversify um, what we're hearing? Yeah, and I kind of—it's interesting you bring up too. You know, you kind of mentioned five or ten players. Is it more valuable, do you think, in your experience, to do a smaller testing pool rather than having, you know, a hundred players or doing one of these like soft launches, for example? Yeah, you're gonna do you're gonna do like a hundred players later on um, when you want to validate at scale. So right now you're just trying to kind of like test the waters, build your knowledge. You're you're expanding. So you can decide, you can expand forever. You know, you could uh, expand for infinity if you wanted. But I think what, since this, since you're gaining insights to sort of inform, 
your marketing or inform the direction of your game, maybe inform um, a live ops feature where you're just trying to understand better. You can decide uh, how confident you want to be, but you can start pretty small. Also, this kind of work, there's a lot to ingest. You know, you have videos, so qualitative work like this is time consuming. So I think it's good to, to pick a number that's um, going to be sustainable for you and your team. And I also think that what you can do is, you know, one person doesn't have to be the ingester of all the knowledge. You can share that work and then come together. And that can actually be part of your analysis too. So you can be like, here's what I heard. And you can kind of summarize what you heard um, and do some affinity, you know, affinity diagramming or brainstorming um, right away. Uh, and so this makes things a lot more sustainable for, for you as either the sole researcher or the few of you, if you're, if you're deciding to do it as a team. Yeah, and we actually have a question from the audience here. Um, what would you kind of recommend to get started with this kind of research? If you're just, you know, let's say you're a um, company, you're an indie uh, developer, you maybe have yeah. one or two employees, you have this game, you think, okay, I want to try to develop something uh, in this direction with exploratory. What would be kind of the way to just very basically get started? What, what are the basic building blocks of that? Yeah. So I'd say what you're going to do is you're going to come together. If you're an indie developer, I'm sure there's things that you're fascinated by because as game developers, we're, we're, we're making things that simulate life, right? So what are you curious about? Is it something related to art? Is it something related to psychology? Is it something related to, um, like, do you love monster trucks? <laughs> You know, what is it that you're really excited and curious about um, that perhaps relates to like other people also have some lived experience related to what it is you're curious about uh, that you could then um, create a slideshow, put, you know, put a slide deck together with, you know, a couple questions. Really, essentially, there's like, if you were doing this work in real time, you would ask a person, you basically start with one question and you wouldn't even really make an interview guide. You basically just say like something like, like let's take connection again as the sure. example. And um, you'd say, you know, you know, what went through your mind the last time you felt connected to someone in a game? And probably you would have screened people in. You would try to screen people in to know that, that they had previously felt connected in a game. And, and, and when we screen for those things, you, you kind of try to obfuscate exactly what it is you're screening for because you don't. You don't want people to guess just so that you know they get into your study but basically you start there and so you start that as your like guiding light and then decide okay like maybe we just want to ask people that question or maybe we want, we want a little bit of visual reference say in our slideshow so that people get an idea of like what it is we're, we're trying to get at absolutely and that's a really an interesting point too kind of building that slide deck um mm -hmm. so you know when people use Playtest Cloud, for example, and yeah, there's other services out there too. Maybe you're doing it on your own. Um, yeah, people often will do like a concept test or a mm -hmm. survey. Is that typically, do you need a build to kind of get started to do this exploratory work? Or do you, can you just build it from, you know, zero ground and just build it from nothing? You need nothing. You just need oh, your no. curiosity. You just, and then, so, so what we've so what things that have been really cool I feel like it, there was um this there's this tool Canva so you don't absolutely need completely zero but I really like that tool Canva I think it's called and then or even just going on Pinterest and so say um one of the things one a project uh, I was involved with in the past was trying to understand affinity to like um an NPC and so what direction so what kinds of emotions or reactions do people have to possible character types. So that is kind of going into the solution space, but you're, you're, but what you're still trying to, you don't necessarily know what the solution is going to be. Um, you just want to understand uh, perhaps even what people might be drawn to currently in current games. Like what characters are you really like attached to? I remember being really attached to Miranda when I played Mass Effect and I just like loved her. So, but, but it's not just like who or what or your preference, it's about why 
And so can you extract those like inner reasonings and philosophies to really use it, to create a really deep understanding so that your game just kind of really innovates and pushes beyond just, yeah, we know people like this and we're going to do the same versus like we really have this deep understanding and and we, we're going to be able to do more than um, what's already out there. Yeah, and I think it's interesting too, you know, talking about um, the difference between, you know, maybe you're an indie studio and you just have, you're developing something based on your personal likes, but also kind of flipping that on right. its head. Maybe you are working for one of these tier A, huge, you know, 500 plus uh, employee companies, and it's more that you want to either improve uh, a yeah. game or maybe you want to uh, develop something kind of based on research. How would you approach it in that kind of direction? Just saying, okay, we, want, we don't know really what we want to develop, but we still have more parameters than just you know, two guys in a basement kind of. Uh, sure, right. Yeah, I mean, I realize we're not all just, we're not all able to just be working on the exper experimental gameplay workshop, you know, like the GD the mm -hmm. awesome GDC session where we can really go, like, go wild. And I realize not all of us are in that situation. But sort of the other, you know, sort of the other side of that is you have, like, a fair, you know, you have a larger budget and you have more resources um, to do this kind of work. Um, and I think the, 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 the lens you're kind of giving is say you already have um, a game that's out there, maybe it's quite a success, but you're thinking about layering more features on it to um, extend its life, you know, maybe for your elder players. Um, and uh, what I've experienced in the past is that just, you know, usually teams don't quite yet know very in depth about their players. And I think this is also a great way to just say, okay, rather than say getting out of our heads and looking at say competitor audiences or other players, now is the opportunity to just start learning about your audience. And you can even do this work just in tandem to some of the other work you're doing. Say, hey, we're gonna we're gonna learn about from five new players, you know, each one month or each week and have them um, you know, go through the slideshow and talk about like what, you know, why are you playing this game? And, you know, what goes through your mind when you play it? Um, maybe there are certain features you really want to understand. So you're trying to get knowledge about your player base. There's also so much stuff you can do outside of the game. Perhaps you're trying to expand um, the market. So perhaps you want to understand um, uh, how people like perceive your brand. That's another thing you can use this kind of work for. So you're just kind of trying to say, explore, you're trying to explore your game further and understand your game more deeply as and in, in, within the realm of the people who are playing it. Awesome, and we're getting uh, quite a few questions coming in and uh, definitely keep them coming. Uh, we'll be very happy to answer all your questions in this um, kind of session over the next uh, about 40 minutes or so. Um, one of the questions we do have um, is from Carla. And she kind of asks, um, what are the challenges you've really encountered when uh, testing uh, with kids um, mm. while recruiting? Um, how is that completely different? I know we, we have, you know, obviously there's some different privacy concerns um, oh, yes. that we, we are good with, but kind of beyond that, um, what other considerations do you really need to make um, when testing with kids? Yeah, testing with kids is super interesting. And I actually, so when I, when I worked with children um, doing testing with kids back at Sistio, I was definitely mostly working in the solution space. Um, and, and, but it would have been really cool to just talk to children about, um, you know, their hopes and dreams and things that really inspire them for sure. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there to do this kind of work with kids. So um, I will answer this question to the best of my ability, uh, but things have kind of changed. It's been 10 years since I've really done uh, deep work with, with children. But basically you wanna be working closely with your legal team to make sure you're coming in line with like things like COPPA. And you wanna make sure the parent is there because it's the parent that's gonna be signing, signing your, your NDA. So just, so basically I'm, I'm through everything I've discussed today, usually there's some, you know, before you do this work, there's some kind of agreement that people need to agree to, whether it's yours or an agreement that you've worked out with say the, the tool you're using for people to agree to. So you would be first making something, some user research program agreement. You would wanna make sure that you, if you want to use their um, likeness later, they've signed that. And then um, I actually think 
user research with children isn't totally different than user research with adults and just that you you are trying to just understand their needs and their um, and their uh, experiences and observing their behaviors. Um, there are some great, if you're more in the solution space, there's these great, there's this great um, thing that I used uh, back at Cisco called the fun toolkit. So perhaps mm -hmm. the person who asked the question has used this before, but I loved that. And that was just, it's already, it's online, you can grab it. And it's a great way for people, so for children who might not have as much vocabulary to exp express things like emotion, there's images that you can use. I actually have borrowed that to actually bring to um, when I've done usability with adults, um, like in the lab. And uh, so I would use the, 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 the emojis and just have people circle. I mean, it's fun for grownups. We like emojis too, right? So, so hopefully that helps a little bit, um, but there's no reason why you can't do this kind of work with, um, with, with people under 18. I think that's actually a really good point. I've never really thought about kind of doing the emojis kind of thing. And that, that kind of makes it a lot more fun. And yeah, sometimes it's just really hard to quantify your thoughts. That really makes it a lot clearer. So I like that. I like that approach a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That those worksheets, those fun toolkit worksheets are awesome. Um, another question we have here is um, from Richard. He asked, like, so what is the optimal number for uh, user experience testing, uh, for example? Um, he's kind of saying, hey, look, um, if I'm going to use a small testing pool, like we just discussed earlier, you know, mm -hmm. five, 10 players, um, what about if problems kind of go missed? You know, um, how do we make sure that with that small pool, we're not going to, you know, we're not sifting through everything and we might miss something in that capacity? How do you avoid that? Right. So for exploratory work, because you're trying to build your knowledge, you're trying to understand something. You're trying to understand like something so that you use that to inform, say, your game design. Like you're trying to learn about, um, perhaps you're trying to build a game. Like for example, here, like Clubhouse. I think that's a really interesting app sure. that just came out. Like what if you're like, hey, Clubhouse could be a gaming platform, but we really need to understand better like connection. So we want to understand deeply like the mindset or the mental model of connection so that we can use, say, the emotions people feel when connected to, say, to inform a game. So it doesn't, mm -hmm. so in that case, it doesn't really, like, you're just, like, the more people you talk to, the more knowledge you're going to build. Or just, like, if you read books about connection, the more knowledge you're going to understand. It's just great to talk to other people so that you're sort of not just, you're not just ingesting the knowledge through your own lens. But when it comes to evaluative work, um, I think, and then, you know, if this, if this isn't answering the question, just let me know, but you, you, you do want to have enough people to say, assess, okay, if there's like a bump in the rug, you know, how many people, um, trip over the bump in the rug. That was my, uh, one of my coworkers, she, her metaphor, and I th think it's a great one. So I'm totally stealing it today. Um, but for exploratory work, basically it's, it's, it's one is a start, two is better and three is even better. So it, it's, it doesn't matter. It's not about like the enough sample size. However, if you are really trying to know, like you do the exploratory work and then you're, you're saying, hey, I'm starting to, to see that there's a trend here. Like there's a group of people with these needs versus there's a group of people with these needs. Then that's when you can start to decide, I need to validate this at scale. I can take some of the things I heard them say, I can put that into perhaps a survey and I can actually understand and measure uh, what we heard from the work we did early on. And I can say, take that to the marketing team and say, hey, look, if we're, we're gonna need to market this game in different ways, because I know that there's people with different needs and different philosophies and different backgrounds. So that's where, when, when you can do this work that you're doing early on, um, you can take the insights and start to, to, to do the science, so the scientific work. Um, where you really need the data and you need, might need to bring it to people on your team that, that prefer the quantitative data. Yeah, that kind of brings up an interesting point that I always like to ask too is kind of um, what is your method for really analyzing data once it's uh, collected and you know, you've done the test and mm -hmm. then you can analyze it and somehow present it. What is your kind of method in that regard? Yeah, so there's a number of ways you can analyze like ex exploratory qualitative work. So for example, I mean, we can sort of use like obviously in Playtest Cloud, you're going to have videos and people will have been talking 
and responding perhaps to stimuli. Um, and so you're going to need to watch it. And so you're going to, you'll, you, you might have transcripts, um, which can be helpful. But basically what you want to do is start to summarize and extract themes. So you can look and understand things like um, preferences, but not just preferences, say reasons for those preferences. You want to be looking for things like philosophies or guiding principles or, you know, reactions to an emotions felt like in a previous um, experience. It's really great to have people talk about the past because it's really hard for people to think about the, fu the future. So if you're having people like walk, you know, walk me through, um, you know, a time that, for example, a time you felt really connected to someone, you know, maybe you're trying to learn about the identity because you're iterating and you're making, you're going to make this the best avatar system, you know, for, for the, for the metaverse. So, you, you know, what, you know, tell me, uh, you know, what went through the, your mind the last time you created an avatar that you really, you really cared about. So they're going to talk to you about what went through their mind. There's people who spend hours and hours on their avatar. So how do you know what they want? It's it's easier to, or you're going to get better information for having them like walk through it. So then you take that and you kind of summarize that. You could summarize each person. Um, you can extract things that you really liked from the from the um, transcript, and then you could bring those insights. You can come together. Uh, there's a great tool called like affinity, affinity mapping can be great. Or you could uh, just like grab sort of the, you know, the clips or, you know, not really clips, you know, the transcripts, and you can bring them to your game jam, bring them to your brainstorming session so that you actually have, so then you're actually really doing user centered design um, and uh, using what you have to inform your process. So, you know, you can do some really deep analysis or you can kind of take what you have and go straight straight into the, the user-centered work. Awesome. And uh, we have another question uh, coming in here. This one is from uh, Daniel. And he says, uh, when first diving into exploratory research, um, it can be really hard to interpret results and to extract mm -hmm. meaningful analysis in the beginning. Um, could you maybe suggest any best practices or guidelines to not get sidetracked with irrelevant details? but uh, remain open to interesting findings and results as of the research. Yeah, okay, so I'd say, yeah, I think that's great. And I think, you know, we were just talking a little bit about analysis. So I think a way to do that, and uh, hopefully this helps, because you want to decide, okay, what, it, you know, you're going to come together and say, what are we, what are we really curious about? And a way to think about that is um, to, to decide what are the dimensions you care about and what are the dimensions that are too, like, um, this is, this, and this is a term uh, that um, N.D. Young uses a lot. She's, she's like a really expert problem space researcher. So she, she talks a lot about dimensions. So I'm just gonna borrow, you know, um, some Don't of the words she expresses it. So you might say, if we're gonna try to understand communication uh, or connection, sorry, connection um, and you, maybe you only want to understand connection during COVID and you don't want to understand, say, like a dimension beyond um, like connecting during the pandemic because that's just too broad. Perhaps you're really trying to understand like family connection and that's the only dimension that you're trying to explore. That can really help you narrow down when you're doing your summarization to say like, okay, we're throwing, we're not like focusing on that. This is just taking us too far away. I really want to look sort of like in this window and then if you decide you, you're curious about those dimensions later, um, you can come back to that data because it's always going to be there because you have the transcript. Yeah, I think that's really good too. And you can always kind of go in and out through the transcript. I've often heard, and I'm curious what's your opinion, um, some people really like to put video clips into their like little presentations that they mm -hmm. present to key stakeholders. And other people hate quotes and video clips and they say, this is the data and this is it. And they don't really want to include that. What is your opinion on that? Do you include video clips and transcripts in your presentations or do you think it distracts the other key stakeholders and developers? So uh, I, I, I like vocal, I mean, I like hearing people's voices and just because it makes me feel like there's a little more of a human connection. Um, so I think what can help is you wanna summarize like what you, you heard. You can either group people together or you can group themes. So you might say, hey, we're seeing that there's a group of people that have similar motivations, and, sure. and and then and then eventually that might become a, like a set of personas. 
or if you've only talked to five people, that might be hard. So you might just want to instead say, hey, we're hearing these different themes, and then these people are examples. To me, clips are a way to, to, to me, they're, ev they're evidential. It's just like, here's our evidence. Because um, if you're the researcher, you're trying to do the work to, to make things actionable and summarize. You've made a summary, something like um, you've heard from, say, three or four people, you, you know, I feel excited when I see hair in an avatar system that, that is hair that's um, uh, part of my identity. And so that's your summary. So you've heard, maybe you heard that in a number of different ways, but you've summarized that with using a verb. And then, but then you can take the clip from the person who is like a great example of that and you can play it. Um, so that's sort of what, way, the way I think of those things as, as helpful. But, you know, talk to your team and see what they prefer. If they, if they have knee-jerk reactions to clips, then don't put your clips in. Yeah, I guess it's more <laughs> just kind of testing the waters in that capacity, yeah. kind of knowing your audience, knowing your team, and maybe it just maybe clips distract, and maybe clips help um, sell your points as well. You just need to, I guess, kind of know your audience in that capacity. Right. Um, we have a question here from uh, David as well. Um, he asks, uh, how would you use unmoderated exploratory research to improve the first time user experience of a game? Um, he says he's specifically looking to use this methodology to improve uh, player onboarding in that first one hour, first uh, 15 minutes of gameplay. Well, so where my head goes, and I know Jake, you and I have talked about like, um, you know, seeking information, but I think, uh, and maybe you have an, an example, but I think where my head goes too is you start with that same question, um, perhaps something like, you know, what, what went through your mind? And sometimes things might be hard to remember because people might play games for like years and years. So you could say something like, you know, what went through your mind the last time you learned how to play a game? Or um, that could be a place to start. You could start there and see how it goes. You know, I'm not sure if people will remember or just what goes through your mind when you start playing a game so that you might learn that there's different mindsets and philosophies around how people want to be onboarded. And then you can then validate at scale how people want to be onboarded and design for you know, the, the segment of people that might most likely spend in your game or the segment of people who, who might need to learn in a certain way. Um, there's also lots of great secondary research too on learning style. So you could use that too as a lens. Um, to say, hey, you know, we're hearing that this is sort of how people are vocalizing, like their learning style. So we actually can relate that to what we know from like learning theory. Yeah, and I've actually, I've seen too, um, you know, you kind of have to, I could see this being used as well for, let's say, you know, maybe you're a game company that mostly focuses on uh, casual uh, mastery games for mm -hmm. women in their 40s. You might not want to approach that if you want to create a game for kids, for example. Yeah. You might want to have a completely different approach, but you would need to still have a exploratory kind of research and kind of d dive deep into say, okay, is our first time user experience um, going to be the same in that capacity? Uh, do we want to develop a first time user experience exactly like this? Are we going to maintain player retention if we keep yeah. this exact methodology? You know, it's kind of one of those things they say, um, you don't want to change the feed on a winning horse, but exactly if it's a different racetrack, you want to make sure that everything is still going to, you know, uh, jive and still work out. You know, you don't want to get stuck in your ways as well. So I think that's yeah. also healthy to kind of just every once in a while check in as well. For sure. Um, so one of the questions too is, uh, I think we hear a lot from uh, leaders. Um, they say this, this, this uh, kind of quote that always floats around is, um, explore the problem space. Mm -hmm. um, but how do we, uh, how do game teams really typically already explore this problem space? How do, how are game teams already doing it? Exactly. The question. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question because I think for me, you know, just in this discussion, you know, leading up to the discussion, it's just something I've been wondering because uh, it's uh, in listening to podcasts, and just UX podcasts, it's like, well, what is problem space research in a games context? And I think um, uh, there's so much interesting frameworks and lens lenses out there that exist that I think have explored the problem space of games and provided us tools to sort of um, 
narrow down uh, how people might be, like why people might be playing games. Like there's uh, Nick Yee's motivation framework um, and his work is mostly informed by quantitative and then there's MDA framework. Mm -hmm. So we have some things that have already been done uh, where people have done some really high level work to understand and start to put theory, to put some theories into game design. Um, but I think there's still so much more work that could be done. So you, I think you can even take those lenses uh, then and use them for, for digging a little deeper into say the areas that are most important to you as a developer. But I'd say like that's where, that's sort of what comes to mind first. And then I also think too, um, you know, game teams do a lot of game jams. Um, I kept saying hackathons, but I think what I mean is game jams. And I think that's kind of a way for us together to come together and explore the problem space of creativity and games and start mashing things up and thinking about um, potential innovation. And I think that's also a way to start to get a seed for what you might want to then explore more deeply to, to get some some insights on other people's lived experiences. Like maybe you want to make a game, you know, about fear or, um, you know, identity, or if, which is a, an example I keep bringing up. So, um, so yeah, so that's sort of how, you know, I realize it's, you know, this isn't necessarily anything new. People have been thinking about this, like, you know, pattern languages and architecture and all sorts of things mm -hmm. since, you know, the 60s. So, but, uh, <laughs> You know, there's so many wonderful design theories out there that we can still draw from. But um, I think sort of when we come together as games user researchers, sort of what I tend to hear is things that lean more towards the evaluative. So I just, you know, I'm sort of saying and hoping to inspire teams to to tip the other way as well. And perhaps it'll it'll breathe some new life into um, into how you design or how you think about your game design practice. Yeah, and it's interesting too, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about um, evaluative work kind of as a launch board to design a new game, but mm -hmm. um, how can exploratory research really uh, help with innovation of features that in an already established game? Yes, so there's quite a lot of work. That was actually a lot of the work that I've been involved with in the past, and usually it um, and involved with things like, you know, we need to add some layering of new features. So I think what's really, really important is just to start to dig into your, to your player base and to learn their, their key motivations. Um, and so, you know, I think sometimes um, some of the work that I've seen done tends to, to um, lean quantitative, maybe doing things like player profiling, but I really want to stress the value of doing work that's more qualitative. If you're, if you want to do player profiling, because it's, it's, it, it is extremely helpful to know like where to focus and who, like what size of the audiences um, that might say like might be spending in your game that has, and perhaps they have different motivations, but you also really need to understand the why. So doing this kind of work to extract those why and those those the reasoning for certain preferences is going to act to help you um, create uh, the new feature. Because if you if you don't know why, how do you know like what direction to go in? Fair enough. Um, so we have a question here from David, and he's asking, um, how would you use a moderated exploratory research? Oh, we actually asked he asked that one about uh, first time user experience. Uh, then we have another one here. Uh, and this one is, how do you ensure the outcome from these exploratory research um, will become design actionables? Um, mm -hmm. Do researchers also uh, need to be responsible for these recommendations? Or how do you really stay neutral uh, when presenting these kind of findings? How do you kind of go in and stay neutral, create design actionables, and um, be yeah. responsible? That's a great question. Yeah, so how do we like what do we do and how we take action and what yeah what is our yeah. responsibility so um i would say that uh so ten, a lot of times for evaluative work the researcher is going to be probably making some might be making something like, like a findings and recommendations table mm -hmm. um for this kind of work i would say that's pro you, you're probably not necessarily going to be making re recommendations you might be taking the work you, what you really want to be communicating is the pattern that you're extracting the themes that you've seen um, uh, about 
things like latent needs, you know, things that you needs or motivations um, for for people that you might not have realized before, uh, like reasoning for doing something. Um, and so you want to really communicate that to your team. You can do that by um, putting like uh, showing the themes in an Excel doc, or better yet, you know, you could you can make it in a in a um, report, or like you know, like I mentioned, you could put it say in a Trello board. And these are like sort of like fodder for your creativity. So rather than going all the way to like this is what we need to do, you're saying here's what we know, here's how we have it now. We have this really deep understanding of of connection during the pandemic and what people are doing and what they're experiencing to feel connected. Like perhaps you talk to Fortnite players, uh, Fortnite teenagers, and you, um, you know, there's been a lot of articles about how teenagers are connecting through games. Maybe you really wanna learn about um, Gen Z, you know, cause you're, they're the up and coming generation. So you take those and use those as inspiration. So then I say it's the researcher's job to um, say like run, maybe just like run the workshop, but this is a way for you to come to your team and collaborate and have fun actually thinking about like, what do we build and how do we um, use these insights to design, like to design a really new experience around connection or a game around connection. And those are just like very high level examples. I think, you know, you'd wanna take this and align it to whatever your teams are thinking about right now. But that's, I'd say, the researcher's responsibility, or like whoever's wearing the researcher hat. Um, mm -hmm. So you might want to look up some best practices for, say, running running a remote workshop. Um, but or or you you give people some home, you give each other some homework, and say, here, take take these like five insights, and go and turn those into game mechanics. Um, I, I mentioned mm -hmm. the MDA framework before. There are some mm -hmm. great examples, like. From, so MDA is mechanics, dynamics, aesthetics. Perfect. And there's aesthetics are things like sensation, fantasy, challenge. You know, mechanics are things like drafting, match three. Like, what if you like layered a mechanic onto, um, you know, a behavior, uh, an emotion that someone described to uh, about like feeling connected during the pandemic through games. Um, and so, so that's sort of like one way. So it's, I guess you'd have to. And you can also work with your game designer, I think, too, to think about some cool ways to take the insights and turn them into to something to something new and innovative. You know, it's interesting, too. It seems like a lot of the stuff that we've been discussing here has been a lot more, you know, concept testing, surveys, and that sort of thing. What if, and we kind of maybe touched on this a little bit earlier, um, what if I have a build to something? I have a game that's really established. I don't necessarily want to create a whole concept test. I don't necessarily want to do surveys and that sort of thing. Can I just run a, a play test, for example, and then go through it and use that as uh, exploratory research? Does that work or is that really not gonna um, meet your needs? Well, you, you could, I mean, I think, I think um, you're, you're really trying to understand, I think what, what happens when playing a, playing a build is that mm -hmm. our, what we're thinking about is within the construct of what we're doing. So, um, and we're also concentrating on playing the game. So usually for exploratory work, I'm really trying to get people to concentrate on their inner reasoning. So it might be hard to extract inner reasoning, you know, while I'm playing something. It might be easier for someone to talk about their inner reasoning um, and sort of, it's, it's really more about reflection. It's super important to, it's about, you know, it's about reflection. So sometimes it's hard to, you can reflect in action. There's this whole concept of reflection in action and reflection on action, um, which was written by this guy, Donald Schoen. So you could try it. I mean, why not? If you have the time and the wherewithal, like why don't you have five people respond to stimuli and then have five people just think out loud, perhaps, while they're playing your game, I just wonder like what kind, what the data might be like if they're, you know, what if your game's like super twitchy or, you know, very like, you, like extreme concentration, right? So that's sort of like where um, things get tricky. 
Yeah, and I think, what do you kind of, uh, I'm curious, what do you mean by inner reasoning? Um, what does that really kind of sure. entail? Um, yeah, so I think when we have, like, so we might have, and inner reasoning are things that we, you know, the, the reasoning for, say, why we do things. For example, um, uh, today, you know, I had, you know, I, you might ask someone, you know, to walk me through, um, you know, what went through your mind, you know, the last time you had to have a Zoom call during, you know, lockdown. And so people are saying, well, you know, I have to, you know, I have to um, turn my computer to face a certain way. And I said, well, why is that? Well, you know, it's like, I want to have like privacy and, and I want to make sure that I can concentrate um, if my family walks by to go get breakfast. So then, so, so it's not just about like preferences. It's about like the reasoning for preferences. I would say, you know, re inner reasoning is um, understanding the why for preferences. And does that really help you kind of, as a game designer, step out of your own uh, mind and head? And, you know, when you when you work on one game for hours upon hours, workday upon workday, you kind of get into this little bubble. Um, does that really help you step away from it and kind of do these kind of tests to get out of your own head and get out of your own bubble? I think so, because I think we don't really understand why people do things. And, um, you know, you might say during a play test, Right when you're playing, when people are um, playing your build for saying here, you know, I'm sort of drawing from experiences. I remember testing a game that involved like a, an avatar, and so people would come and say, "I I spend hours and hours and hours perfecting my avatar." But in the play test, our goal, like we needed them to, you know, play through other creatures. Mm -hmm. But I really, what I realized is that I really did want to understand deeply, okay, why, you know, why do you spend hours and hours perfecting your avatar? You know, what is going through your mind when you're looking for things? What are you looking for? But why are you looking for that? Um, so that, so that we can actually understand. And, and then the other thing is too, is that, you know, you can ask people to, you know, uh, users have a hard time with solutions. They might offer up a solution, but it's really the reasoning behind why they're asking for that solution that might help you understand and how to take, you know, make an even, even better solution. Um, like another, an example I saw was um, a, a fellow UXer had posted on LinkedIn, like, oh, I was driving and um, listening to Spotify and, and I was listening to Spotify radio and I really liked the song, but I didn't know what it was, but there's no way for it's too hard when I'm driving. And then he, and then he said the solution would possibly be to swipe up, but there's a whole problem space of, you know, what goes through your mind when you're, when you're listening to Spotify or something like Pandora while driving. I realize that's a non-game example, but I feel like that's, that's a example. really concrete example to show like, you want to understand like why like that happened and not just the, the solution offered. And that's where you're going to be like, oh, wow. Like, I think I, as the game developers and the designers, you have the expertise of games. And so you can take that like problem and, and turn it into something like really like cool and innovative. Yeah, and I think we have about uh, seven minutes left. Um, so if anybody has any last questions, we probably have time for one, maybe two more. Um, but really kind of following up on that, so you discover that why, mm -hmm. what do you do with your why? You know, you say, okay, I figured out random exploratory, we found a treasure, for example. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we found a treasure. <laughs> <laughs> we then go and do the why. What yeah. do I now do with this why? Yeah, so I think there's a number of things. So if we're talking, so I think you can think of things on the game level or like like the feature level, the game level or the outside of game level. So you've decided already going into this research, probably maybe like where this research is going to apply. But some, but I've also experienced times where we've done the research and we realized the research we got was for, for like a new game, but it actually could apply to the feature level in a different game. So anyways, so you might say, okay, um, you have the patterns and then you can take those whys and, and turn it into say like an opportunity for like a new like game mechanic or um, at, you could um, then uh, also you, you might have something like what, one of the things we we did was we learned very deeply about a pre, like interest and reasoning around preferences and affinities to a license like characters from a license, and those um, 
we did some really interesting uh, activity. You can also do act like we did some activities, had people do activities. Um, and you can do that in real time unmoderated. Like people can talk about those activities. Like you could have say like what, like what pair, like what characters would you pair up to battle? And then you could extract that and say like those could become um, powers or abilities in the game, or you could actually use that to inform your stat system. Maybe you realize that people think about rarity or um, something is legendary in a, in a way that you didn't realize. And that actually helps you innovate on, um, like on your CCG or your RPG game. So I think these sort of constructs that we, we are as game designers have great expertise about, it's also really cool to, to and important for us to, to learn about how players might also perceive these constructs and like use them and, 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 and act on them. I mean, that's the dynamics part of mechanics, dynamics and aesthetics. And then on the non-game level, yeah, you might be, you might use that to inform like your ads perhaps your ads or how you're marketing, um, your branding and things like that. Absolutely. And, you know, it's kind of interesting too. We see um, kind of on the topic of exploratory research, we see um, non-gaming uses as well, uh, at least with Playtest Cloud and our uses. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of different studios go in and, you know, perhaps they give their um, help center uh, team a, uh, you know, a play test and say, hey, you have X or Y issue. Um, you know, pretend like, okay, you have this problem, that problem, go through the help center, five minutes, um, show us how you would find the answer to that. Or, hey, look through our website and tell us what um, feelings it has. Yeah. In give you. Look through our uh, app store page, you know, look at the, the ratings, look at this and that. And from that, you can actually explore, discover maybe an issue here and there um, from that uh, and kind of that uh, research in that way too. Yeah. That can inform um, your information architecture, like in your help center and things like that. Yeah, and we, so we have about uh, four minutes left. Uh, we have a question here. Um, I think we already kind of covered this, but we can briefly uh, answer it. But uh, what is the best size uh, number of testers for a longitudinal play test? Just a limited number, like one or two, or should I have a bunch of people? We kind of discussed already, we said uh, somewhere between five and 10. Mm -hmm. Is that pretty typical? Yeah, I mean, for a longitudinal study, you're trying to uncover motivations. And I think at this point, you're back in the solution space, right? You're trying to understand if your, your game is evoking, like you're testing your design intent. So it's a little bit different. So, you know, for, for exploratory work, you're expanding your mind, it's divergent. And then in a longitudinal test, you're, 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 you are narrowing down because you are now, um, at least in 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 my experience, you you're probably you're probably maybe in beta, but you can also I mean don't get me wrong you can actually do you can do diary studies to do exploratory work, so perhaps you want to understand people's um, habits over time. So I change you know I change my mind. So um, so I think it just it's the context it's the context in which you're doing the longitudinal uh, work, um, and if it's exploratory, I'd still say you know. Um, three, five, one, uh, this is, you know, I, you know, I'm encouraging teams to, to do this work. So, and, you know, just opening up the door to like one is, is good. I, you know, I think just start with five and then make sure you've, you are, have, um, a variety of people like doing the longitudinal work. Uh, uh there's lots of, there, you know, there's lots of ways you can capture, um, behavior and motivation and emotion over a longer time like perhaps you need to learn about people's experiences and philosophies longer than 20 minutes and that's fair yeah absolutely and um kind of wrapping up here um you know we all we were talking a little bit earlier about um how to really put exploratory research into practice um, mm -hmm. you, know, you can always do workshops uh, system design character classification maybe even a marketing brainstorm. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things we kind of discussed earlier before the call as well, um, you know, even adding uh, quotes of the original stimuli. I really liked uh, in our discussion mm -hmm. today, you kind of talked about like picking key words and really focusing on yeah. that and kind of using that as a, a brain map and that kind of thing to kind of help you guide your exploratory research. Yep. Capacity. There's another um, great tool that's free. It's called FreeMind. I don't know if it still exists, but that's another thing. Like you could take that tool and have, you know, you can do a mind map for each, so say for each participant. So yeah, I think that's a great idea. 
Yeah, well, hey, I want to really thank you for uh, joining us today in this uh, Meet the Experts webinar. Uh, if anybody wants to reach out, um, you can ask us any more questions. Uh, email us at um, hello at playtestcloud.com. Um, we're happy to answer any of your questions that you may have further. Um, as well, if you want to uh, reach out to Sarah, uh, you can do so on LinkedIn. Uh, she's pretty active over there. Um, we will be having uh, more Meet the Experts webinars uh, over the next coming months. Uh, be sure to keep uh, in touch with us on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, um, and a couple other social medias, as well as our uh, newsletters, where we'll announce uh, the next topics and uh, announce the next webinars as they come up. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, be sure to say hi and connect. And uh, have a great rest of your Friday.